Director Ken Loach and screenwriter Paul Laverty have come storming back to Cannes with another tactlessly passionate bulletin from the heart of modern Britain, the land of zero hours vassalage and service economy serfdom. The film portrays, the, in the tradition of Loach's work, um, something that The Guardian describes as fierce, open, angry, unironized and unadorned about a vital contemporary issue whose implications you don't hear on the news. The drama concerns Ricky, who's played by Chris Hitchin, a former construction worker in Newcastle, who lost both his building work and his chance of a mortgage after the economic crash of 2008. It describes a hard-working, affectionate guy with a bit of a temper and a liking for drink. Now, he's resting with his wife, Abby, who's played by Debbie Honeywood, a contract nurse and in-home carer who has to visit dozens of disabled, elderly and vulnerable people every day for their meals, baths and tuck-ins, but isn't able to find the time to tuck in her own kids. And they're played by Seb's, Seb, who's played by Reese Stone, a stroppy teen who has artistic talent but is in trouble with the authorities and his smart kid sister Lisa who's played by Katie Proctor. So joining me to discuss the film and has been a film critic for the day is the IEA's Director General Mark Littlewood. Hi Mark. Hi Darren. So Mark the film portrays quite a depressing state of affairs really. It's the precariousness associated with dramatic changes that are taking place in the labour market that you would recommend as being a thoroughly good thing, right? Was it, did it pull on your heartstrings at all? Well, it's a pretty grim movie, but I mean, if you want to spend a hundred minutes watching something uplifting, can I recommend a Disney cartoon <laughs> as opposed to a Ken Loach um, kitchen soap drama? I mean, Ken Loach's movies are in fairness intended to be depressing and challenging so uh th and this is very much in that format and uh, you rightly say darren it's about the um uh, supposed i think in some cases actual precariousness of the way the world of work is changing so we follow a normal but quite likable family really i mean even Seb, the son, who's a bit of a tear away, you sort of warm to. Uh, and we have 100 minutes of anything that could possibly go wrong for them does go mm -hmm. wrong for them. Um, it's, uh, I think it just about, as a film, fits into the category of tragedy. Mm -hmm. But if much more had gone wrong, I think it would have fitted into the category of farce. Yes. Um, absolutely everything, as I say, that could go wrong does. So um, the basic uh, philosophy of the film is essentially about, I suppose, worker exploitation. Mm -hmm. That um, people doing fairly regular jobs, uh, Ricky becomes a zero hours contract van driver, and his wife Abby, is, as you say, is a care worker, are being paid according to the actual stuff they deliver. Uh, the number of visits, in Abby's case, or the number of packages being delivered on time, in Ricky's case, um, therefore not being absolutely certain that at the end of each week they've got whatever it might be, £300, £400 of, of income. Uh, and their life basically unravels because misfortune hits them. Um, I suppose the moral of the story is that the gig economy is a bad thing and it would be preferable for us to return to a very stable, predictable working environment where you take on a job when you leave school at 16 and you get a carriage clock 50 years later when you retire from the same employer. That seems to be the implicit assumption of the mm -hmm. film. Exactly. There seems to be a sort of an almost romanticisation of this 40-hour week working for an employer in contrast to this terrible gig economy. That's exactly right. I mean, that's the, the, the assumption. Um, the uh, I mean, it's not based on a true story. They, they, there's no claim from uh, Ken Loach that this actually happened to this particular family in Newcastle. Uh, but the the implication throughout, not even the implication, the script, is that unfair burdens and risks are placed on Abby and Ricky as workers. So, uh, for example, the the van that he needs to drive around in, he needs to buy. It's not provided to him as uh, in a traditional working environment. You provide the kit. 
to your employees. Uh, we're sitting in a radio studio in Two Lord North Street. We haven't asked you to provide the microphones. Mm -hmm. The Institute of Economic Affairs has um, provided them, and if they break, the Institute of Economic Affairs will replace them. It won't come out of your pay packet. That's not the, um, the, the, the situation that Rick faces. He has to find some way of buying a van or renting a van. He does that by uh, persuading his wife to sell her car. Uh, uh, he has a sort of technical device which measures when he's delivered packages. That's all on him. If he loses that or that gets broken, he has to pay for a replacement. If the packages get stolen or broken, it's on him. So all of the risk sits on him, and he's got to deliver basically to targets and time. And if he fails to do that, they might shift him to a less profitable route. Uh, and that burden keeps, um, you know, mounting on his shoulders. And I say everything that can go wrong does go wrong for him. So the, yeah, there's certainly the implication is, wouldn't it be better if we were able to give workers tons of job security based simply on their hours? But the unspoken part of it is rather cunningly, but I think slightly duplicitously, we don't really investigate the counterfactual. Um, the it probably isn't true that this delivery firm that um, Ricky works for used to offer guaranteed security for everybody irrespective of their illness or wanting to take a day off to deal with a family problem. It's quite probably the case, and it's obviously fictional, but it's quite probably the case that this delivery firm exists absolutely at the margins of viability and is only able to put together a coherent business because of the way it structures its uh, its staff and its work. And I wondered if you actually remade this movie in a different way, um, whether it would work. So you could theoretically have had exactly the same story, but rather than Ricky and Abby, the mother and father, working in the gig economy, supposing they set up their own business. Supposing they actually said, you know, we've got a great idea to, I don't know, sell cakes or wash windows. Uh, we're going to leave our present employment. We're going to sell off some of our assets to get us going with a bit of capital. And uh, we're going to run our own business. You could then also afflict them with everything going wrong. You know, whatever. They fall off a ladder while they're doing the window cleaning. And uh, that would have exactly the same consequences. And I guess the moral of that hypothetical film would be never set up your own business. Um, far, far better to actually be an old-fashioned wage slave uh, where you work either for a major company that underwrites everything or probably, in Ken Loach's view, you work for the state. So do you think, though, you do acknowledge, you do recognise that for some people there is an element of precariousness and some people are struggling out there in the labour market ha ha with it having changed so fast? Well, yes. I mean, it would be completely preposterous to say that there is nobody out there who is struggling in the labour market. Clearly, people struggle in the labour market, things go wrong, uh, people are uh, metaphorically struck by lightning, um, are finding it difficult to make ends meet. Yeah, I mean, this is this is definitely true for a, you know, a good number of families. I'm not trying to wish away that, uh, that happening. But the question is, if you like, what's the alternative? Uh, and that just isn't touched on in the film at all. It's just a sort of um, there's a sort of implication that all of this could be done in a fairer way. That I guess all of the risks and delays would be borne by the business rather than the worker. If you're mugged and the packages are stolen, presumably that's underwritten by the business, not on not coming out of Ricky's pay packet. If it takes two hours to go and feed Mrs. Miggins and tuck her into bed. Uh, rather than the plan for 20 minutes, well, th again, that's paid for by the, the business or the state, not by uh, uh, Abby having to cut her break. And that seemed to me a bit of a fantasy, because like all things here, there are trade-offs. And if you want the business to bear all of the risks, uh, rather than the employee, then on straight logical thinking economics, that will have a downward impact on wages. Uh, the business will have to insure all its vans, pay for all its vans, insure all the kit and equipment, pay compensation for when packages go missing, and therefore there is less money left to pay the workers. So there is, I think, almost automatically the flip side of flexibility is precariousness. 
it definitely applies in the gig economy, but it also applies, as I've said, to setting up your own business. I mean, that's very flexible. You can choose to work five hours a day, 10 hours a day, 18 hours a day, two days a week or seven days a week setting up your own business, huge risks involved, great deal of flexibility involved as well. Uh, But with flexibility comes risk. And I mean, that's almost trivially true in, in, in my view. And by and large, if you look at the aggregate statistics, rather than a single fictitious case, which Loach puts forward here, I think the gig economy is a is a very good thing. It's providing choice. It fits uh, what a lot of workers want, probably not the demographic portrayed in this film. If you uh, are a uh, mum, dad with two young kids who uh, need the security of an income, you're probably better, I would guess, in normal circumstances to plump for a traditional job but if you're young person no dependents you know living in the spare room with mum and dad or if you're retired have a pension but want a bit more money or if you're thinking of setting up your own business but don't want to put all of the eggs in that one particular basket and you want to do 10 15 20 hours a week um, driving or or caring or whatever it might be, then these are fantastically good opportunities. And actually, the economic statistics and, and polling bears that out. Well, I was about to mention the polling because you mentioned the trade-offs, and I wonder what the trade-offs would be for... A lot of people mention the solutions to that precarious element being more rights, which means less flexibility. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I'm, most polls also show that those in the gig economy quite like the flexibility element, and some even need that offered. You know, you speak to Uber drivers, for example, and they talk about how they can turn off the clock and go pick up their kids from school, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. drop them off, then they can turn the clock back on. You know, they need that flexibility sure. that's offered. But where's the trade-off? Because if people also want more rights, but also the flexibility... You know, what, what's striking the right balance? Well, I mean, you'd expect me to say this, but I think that's almost, that's what the market decides, okay? I mean, it's, it, the rise of the gig economy shouldn't lead us to believe that traditional work has disappeared. It, it, it hasn't. Um, I mean, in the UK over the last three years, we have seen the gig economy double in size to, I think it's now just shy of 5 million workers in the gig economy. That's a big chunk and a growing chunk. But still... Most of us in the workforce are contracted. We get all of the employment rights associated with that. We can't choose to sell those employment rights, by the way. Um, so I have a right to paternity leave that I really don't want. I'd rather the IEA gave me an extra £1,000 a year and, and I would scratch that right from my contract. So the security that I have um, around some of these rights, I would rather have the flexibility and more money. And I think it's the market that sorts that out. There's a, a, you know, there are now an increasing number of ways where we can choose to work. And look, it's probably not true to say that we're absolute full employment in the UK economy. But again, I would ask about this film and analysis is, okay, it looks really bleak. And it is really bleak because in this particular scenario, everything goes wrong. But compared to what? Would we rather that Ricky and Abby were... Um, struggling to get by in the early or mid 80s when there was massive um, unemployment, uh, three million jobs going around knocking on doors. Oh, you know, can anybody please find a bit of work for me to do? No, sorry, mate, we haven't got anything. Uh, that might well be the alternative to the gig economy. It's just sort of assumed that the alternative is to have much richer, much more benevolent, much more caring employers. And those can't be magicked up. It's the sort of thing that Hayek would call the fatal conceit. You look at something that you assume to be, and indeed may very well be, a problem or something that's suboptimal, but you can't just hand wave away all of those elements to it and just magic up security and guarantees and certainties of income. That that just doesn't work. And so I rather like the fact that there's more and more choice in how to live your life. But some of those choices are choices that have more risk and precariousness than would have been true in the labour market 30 years ago. But why are we assuming that minimising risk is the ace of trumps? I don't think it is. Well, the film also argues that the the right to a family life has been eroded in modern Britain. I mean, do you agree with that statement? Do you think that the change in the way in which we all work and that rising 5 million number of people in the gig economy 
is the cause of that. I don't believe that we're eroding family life. Again, in aggregate, you'll probably be able to point to, you know, one family that's struggling now more than it was five years ago or ten years ago. So this is, uh, I'm making an aggregate point. But generally speaking, and astonishingly, people just don't seem to accept this, working hours are falling um, uh, quite dramatically, really. Um, I mean, it's really only over the last hundred years that the concept of weekends has mm-hmm. existed at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're seeing a gradual decline in uh, hours worked per week. We're also seeing, which you need to build into the overall equation, much longer retirements. Uh, I mean, it's sort of gone, thankfully, for most people of the days where you work your fingers to the bone and retire at 65 and drop dead at 66. Uh, again, that will definitely happen to some people, but it's now much more common that you retire perhaps even a bit earlier than 65 or dial down your hours to 10 or 15 hours a week and perhaps live into your 80s. So the proportion of our time that we spend working uh, is going down even for the labour force, but is definitely going down as a proportion of our lives. Uh, and all things equal, that gives you, I'm not sure I'd call it a right to a family life, but much more access to a family life. That's more leisure time that you can spend on the things that you really value in life. And whether that's spending time with your children or socialising with your friends or reading books or whatever it might be, uh, as a general rule, the trajectory is benign in this area. You touched on it slightly, but I wonder, do you reckon, as as Ken Loach clearly does reckon, these people would have been better off in the pre-gig economy world? No, I don't. And that's that's what I think the flaw is in the film. I mean, again, um, in telling a story, in producing a drama, one tends to go to the extreme. And I don't wholly rule out that you might be able to find um, a few families in Newcastle and paint a picture of what the job market was in, say, the 1990s and in these very small number of cases point out they would be better off. But in aggregate, no. I mean, in aggregate, Newcastle is far better off than it was um, 10 or 20 years ago. It's taken us a bit of time to recover from the 2008 crash, of course, but 2019 is the richest year for humanity to be alive, the highest income we've ever had in human history. And as far as I'm aware, that applies to Newcastle just as much as it applies to virtually every other part of the world. So things are improving, but that doesn't mean they improve permanently all the time for all people. So the question is whether a a drama about one hypothetical family is a reasonable basis from which to extract general rules. And I don't think it is. The general rule here is that things are improving, getting better. People are slowly but steadily getting richer and earning more money per hour and therefore able to work fewer hours. And the fact that you can portray the worst of all worlds in a 100-minute film, I think, doesn't, shouldn't act as a guide to what our economic or labour market policy should be. And that beautifully segues me into my final two questions. So the first question being... I wonder how many stars you would give Ken Loach's film. Mm-hmm. Secondly, if I make you the director and screenwriter of a pro-gig economy film in which you've got Ricky from Newcastle um, depicted and his family, how would you sell you know, that vision of, of, of modern Britain mm-hmm. as actually being, as you've described, more prosperous, better off and more sure. flexible? Okay, on rating the film, I... I didn't think it was as good a piece of cinema as some of his previous films. But although I do disagree quite fundamentally with Ken Loach's politics, I think he's quite a compelling filmmaker. So, uh, you know, I don't just watch a film and then give it five stars if it agrees with my moral view of the universe and naught stars if it doesn't. I don't think this was quite as compelling or engaging as, say, I, Daniel Blake, which was uh, a, a film about welfareism. But I'd probably give it three and a half stars. I mean, it's a well-acted, challenging piece of drama. And the fact that I'm sceptical about the picture of the workforce that it purports to paint shouldn't detract from it as a well-produced piece of cinema. Your second question about um, what sort of film would I make about the upsides of the gig economy, I think actually goes right to the heart of a real problem for 
um, optimistic free market liberals in that I wouldn't make such a film. It would be boring. Uh, what sort of compelling piece of drama could you have showing that I now have an extra two hours a week to watch television because my salary has gone up or I have another hour a week to spend with my parents or with my family? Um, softly good, slightly incrementally improving niceness is not very good drama. It's why most soap operas are full of utterly miserable characters facing catastrophe. You don't see very many people in Coronation Street or EastEnders where the fundamental part of their story is things got about 2% better for me last year. I mean, it's just not, it's not the sort of thing that people plug in to watch. It's more um, family breakdown, they've lost their job, they've got a drugs habit, whatever, or even more extreme things, you know, they've been kidnapped or God only knows what else. So bad news and scary stuff makes much better drama than happy stuff. And I think this is a problem for those of us who are saying, by and large, the world's getting better. We'd like it to get better faster. Um, there are some things to complain about and there are some tragedies, but steady as she goes and being um, warm and welcome to many of the changes in the world, such as flexible working, is by and large the right policy approach, is good and true economics, but would be utterly dull, catastrophically boring cinema. Couldn't you do a side by side? You've got the sort of pre-gig economy world and then this new... That would be interesting if you sort of put together, rewrote this story as a kind of extreme counterfactual the other way, that um, actually there wasn't the money to provide any sort of social care, so all of these people who were looked after by Abby actually just sort of dropped dead in their own homes because they aren't being properly fed. Uh, Abby doesn't have a job at all, so she just sort of sits at home. She has more time with her kids, but, you know, is... Um, bored and listless and feels she has no purpose in life and becomes an alcoholic or a drug addict. Uh, same goes for Ricky, you know, because there is not any permanent construction jobs. Uh, this delivery company doesn't even exist, so there's nothing for him to do apart from turn to a life of crime. You could take the basic plot and bend it in a, an extreme uh, alternative direction. Uh, but you would be comparing... It, to do that, I think you would sort of fall into the trap that Ken Loach has set us. You would be comparing his bad news story with a catastrophic news story. Mm -hmm. And as I say, that makes for pretty good drama, quite compelling drama, but I think it makes for very, very bad public policy making. Well, now we'll put it to everyone listening to this podcast to tweet us at IEA London and let us know whether or not you think modern Britain is all the better for having a more flexible labour market or whether or not you long for a sort of 1950s-style 40-hour working week guaranteed. Um, you can tweet us at IEA London. You can subscribe to this podcast wherever it is that you get your podcast. Cheers, Mark. Thanks, Darren.